will be given by the Reverend Dr. Lawrence A. Martin, minister of the First United Presbyterian Church of Muncie. Reverend Martin. Let us pray. God of our fathers, who shapes the destiny of nations and of all within them, we pause to give thanks this morning for the urgings and influences which have brought each of us to this place at this time in our lives. We do not covet honors, but we are grateful for the recognition which is given to diligent study and to the acquisition of useful economic and social skills. We thank you for this university and for all who contribute to its greatness as an institution of creative advancement in this community and in the lives of all who come under its influence. We praise you, the fountainhead of all knowledge, for the excitement we have known in both teaching and learning, for the uncovering of new ideas, for the creative interaction between teacher and student, and above all, for the realization of the vastness of that truth of which we can only sample. O Lord, who demands justice in the marketplace and mercy in all our dealings, teach us the social responsibility which comes to those who have the benefit of higher education. Let learning equip us for life in its broadest sense as we become creative agents for the renewal of the human community. And let learning humble us as we face those imponderables for which men have no ready answer. And to you, the Lord of all truth, be honor and glory, dominion and power both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> members of the graduating class, members of the faculty, parents, relatives, and friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, the 67th commencement of Ball State University. The music today, as you have learned, is being provided by Mr. Roger McConnell of our music faculty and the University Symphony Band. The singing of the national anthem was led by Mr. Larry D. Boy, also of the music faculty. And I again acknowledge the participation of Reverend Dr. Martin, who gave the invocation. We are particularly pleased to have with us for this commencement six of the seven members of the Ball State University Board of Trustees. I'm going to read their names and ask each one to stand as the name is called. I would ask you as the audience to withhold applause until all have been introduced. First of all, Dr. Alexander M. Bracken of Muncie, the president of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Bracken. 
Next, Mr. Tom Wallace of Indianapolis, Vice President of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Wallace. Mr. Will Parker of Muncie, Secretary of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Parker. Mrs. Robert O'Malley of Richmond, Assistant Secretary of the Board of Trustees. Mr. M. Thomas Harrison of Columbus. And Mr. F. Edwin Showweiler of Fort Wayne. Would you please join me in thanking and acknowledging their presence? The seventh trustee, Dr. Dean Spiker of Osceola, had planned to be with us, called this morning to indicate he would not be able to come, but extends his regrets, but his greetings to all of you. Others on the platform I should like to recognize at this time, and again, would you please withhold applause until all have been introduced. Mr. Edward Langus, who is from Muncie and is president of the Ball State University Alumni Association, Mr. Langus. Dr. Richard W. Burkhart, Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties. Dr. Robert P. Bell, Vice President for Business Affairs and Treasurer. Dr. Merrill C. Byrell, Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. Dr. Oliver C. Bum, Vice President for Public Affairs and University Development. Dr. Victor B. Lawhead, Dean of Undergraduate Programs. Dr. Robert H. Kenker, Dean of the Graduate School and of course Mr. Boy and Reverend Mr. Martin. Now would you join me in expressing appreciation of these folks as well. We are privileged and honored today to have as our speaker Dr. Roger W. Hines, President of the American Council on Education. A native of Grand Rapids, Michigan, Dr. Hines began his collegiate studies at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, a city of which many of you have heard mentioned before. His baccalaureate degree was earned at Calvin College in his native city of Grand Rapids. From there, he moved to Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan, where he remained for 25 years, except for a four-year tour of duty in the Psychological Services Division of the Army Air Force in World War II. Dr. Hines holds the MA degree in clinical psychology and the PhD degree in social psychology, both awarded by the University of Michigan. He moved through the faculty ranks to professor of psychology at the university before becoming dean of the College of Literature, Arts and Science and Arts, and later vice president for academic affairs. In 1965, he left Michigan to become Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley, serving during the tumultuous years of 1965 through 1971. He then returned to the University of Michigan for a year before succeeding Logan Wilson as president of the prestigious American Council on Education in 1972. His service to education and the nation go well beyond this progression of professional assignments, however. Dr. Hines has served as a member of the Advisory Committee on Graduate Education of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and as Chairman of the Science Advisory Committee of the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. His board memberships are numerous. Indicative of the breadth of this list would be the National Academy of Education, the Assembly of Behavioral and Social Sciences, the Brookings Institution, and Kaiser Steel Corporation. His academic honors are truly impressive. A Phi Beta Kappa, Dr. Hines is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a number of several honoraries, including Sigma Xi. But even more than these, however, the awards granted to our speaker reveal his impact on his students, his faculty colleagues, and his fellow man. And among them are Outstanding Teacher Award and Faculty Distinguished Service Award, University of Michigan. Awards for Berkeley's Most Useful Citizen and also the Greatest Service, Public or Private, to Northern California. The Clark Kerr Award, the only honor of its kind conferred by the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley, for outstanding service to higher education and a citation by the San Francisco Conference on Religion, Race, and Social Concern for outstanding community leadership as educator, 
churchman and citizen. But now with all of this impressive list of credentials, however, I would say that those of us who have had the privilege of coming to know Roger Hines and to work with him, even if only in a modest way, recognize him as one who, in addition to being thoroughly competent, is a sensitive human being, ever mindful of the need for improving the human condition and our relationships as fellow humans. In this day of new and different challenges to the world that is ours as participants in the eternal search for truth and in service to our society and its people, I can think of no one I would rather have occupying the chair of President of the American Council on Education. And in like manner, I am most pleased to present to you as our speaker on this important occasion, none other than Dr. Roger W. Hines. Dr. Hines. Thank you, Mr. President. Graduates, parents, friends, members of the board, members of the faculty. It's a real pleasure for me to share with you this splendid occasion, an event uh, so long anticipated and hoped for. As a graduate myself and as the father of three graduates, I seriously doubt that there are any emotions in this audience that I haven't, that I don't understand and haven't shared. Pride, anxiety about the future, bewilderment, thankfulness, surprise, unbelief, guilt, fear of exposure, and relief, just to mention a few. Now, pleasant as it is to be here, I, I think I ought to make clear that, and although you haven't thought about it, at all, hadn't had any reason to, you ought to consider that the plight of the commencement speaker is not actually a happy one. For one thing, all parts of the audience expect different things. The faculty and administration, in my years of experience, I long suspect, expect the commencement address to be kind of a last-minute effort to tidy things up. Uh, one last lick, one might say. The parents and friends might reasonably expect a brief taste of the academic fare, a sample of the intellectual life they worked so hard to provide for the graduates. And my experience with the opinions of graduates uh, lead me to believe that they perceive the address to be one of those rituals that play a part in academic ceremonies to which they have resigned themselves, particularly if it's short. Now, some, uh, some uh, subversive reporters intent on destroying the morale of commencement speakers did a survey of graduates five or six years after graduation and asked them, who was your commencement speaker and what did he or she say? Well, the results were uniformly disastrous, uh, uh, for commencement speakers, that is. Uh, very few remembered who the speaker had been and virtually none remembered what had been said. And I recall one response that kind of epitomizes all this for you. One respondent said that she didn't know what he had said or what his name was, but she recalled that he was some kind of a general. It turned out he was the president of General Electric. <laughs> now, if you, if, and that's uh, by no means a safe assumption, but if you heard my name in the introduction, or read it in the program, I've speculated that the best I can expect then is for one of you in response to a similar question in the future can also, will also admit that no recollection of who it was or what was said, but you might add that he had something to do with a food company that made ketchup. <laughs> Work at that a little bit now. <laughs> now, just three weeks ago in the, I was at Mount Vernon, and I saw a young lady, a very attractive young lady, in a sweatshirt with Ball State University across it. And in the kind of wistful thought that maybe Ball State might be different, I started a conversation with her, a very animated one, and finally I told her that I was coming here to speak at commencement. Oh, great, she said. 
Then, not having the sense to leave well enough alone, I asked her if she had attended her graduation commencement. No, she answered very sprightly, but she wished me well. <laughs> now, having done what I could to elicit your deep sympathy, I plunge into my role. Actually, I thought a good deal about, about you and this occasion, and I do have something I want to say. I should state that among those audiences that I have, that I outlined, I'm only going to talk to one, and that is the constituents, the members of the graduating class. The rest of you are entitled to listen. I'd like to talk to you about the uses and abuses of power. And I do so this be because power or influence or authority, and I know you can make distinctions among those words, but for my purposes they're interchangeable. Power is an inevitable accompaniment of responsibility, and I assume that you have committed yourself to a life of responsibility, a willingness to accept it when it is offered, and a willingness to seek it when you see that, it, that you're needed. And responsibility in the context I'm referring to means responsibility for the spiritual and social and physical well-being, economic well-being of your fellow man. In a very real sense, the assumption here is that I share and you share the notion that we are our brother's keeper. I said that responsible, but one is responsible when one has the power to act in one way or another. The statement, I am not responsible, can only be said validly when it is indeed the case that one can say, I had no power to influence the situation. Now, even if I have gotten you uh, to a tentative re willingness to listen to a 12 to 15 minute discussion, I want you to keep that number in mind, discussion of the uses of power, I am sure that most of you would say you are much more keenly sensitive to your lack of it. And the less polite among you might say that this is but one final glaring example of an educator being unable to be relevant, except to some distant point in the future and then only if all goes well. But I'd like to suggest to you that, at the outset, that power is a matter of degree, that it's not a matter, that not the exclusive accompaniment of exalted positions in government or industry. And it's not the case that one goes from no power to significant power. The accretion is gradual, and some of you have already had a good deal, and for the rest of you, some power is a virtual certainty. And by power, as I said, I mean the capacity to influence and modify the conditions under which people live, the choices they make, the rewards they receive. And this capacity to influence may come from lots of different places, from the control of resources, or legal authority, or superior knowledge, or a dozen other ways. And by this definition, then, it's clear that all of you have, or will have, will continue to have power. Parents, teachers, supervisors, doctors, lawyers, individual policemen on the beat, the lifeguard, along with members of Congress, civil officials, and the executives of corporations. It's also the case that throughout the life of most of us, the power we have is derived from those for whom we work. It may not be, is not likely to be, direct. As aides and assistants and colleagues, we have some, and sometimes a great deal, of the power of those above us. Now, I'm prompted to reflect on the uses of power as I think of the current calamities in Washington, those complex and pervasive events called the Watergate Affair. I want to make it very clear that it is not my intention to take sides, to present my conclusions about guilt and responsibility, to gloat in some kind of self-righteous indignation, or to relish the discomfort of people in power, but rather to consider with you some of the lessons concerning leadership and authority which all of us, I submit, can properly and usefully contemplate. The widely publicized malfunctions in Washington are not unique to exalted offices. 
They can be present in all institutions in our society and at all administrative levels. They can affect followers as well as leaders, subordinates as well as superiors, the owner of the vineyard, and the worker within it. To the extent that these malfunctions reflect the frailty of mankind and the temptations to which we are all susceptible, and I think they do, they are potentially possible for all of us. Anyone who has held a position of significant responsibility has experienced one or another of the maladies represented by Watergate. We have all had or have come to having, come close to having our own little Watergates. All of you will confront the same choices and be obliged to face the same decisions. This observation about the pervasiveness of the problems in no way justifies anyone. It should serve, however, to make us humble. And let me be explicit about some of the aspects of leadership and the exercise of power that I think we're obliged to contemplate, particularly if we think of Watergate, not in terms of what others did or didn't do, but now, as I urge upon you, we look upon them in terms of what we should learn. First, it seems to me we are reminded of the age-old problem of means and ends and of the ancient wisdom that they cannot be separated. Noble ends pursued by ignoble means end in disaster. The results not just pragmatically unsuccessful, but permanently harmful and destructive. And while we may and do in our desire to win or to show sympathy or understanding, discount unworthy acts committed for noble causes, we really know that this is hollow indeed. We are obliged, I'm suggesting, always to be sensitive to the presence in ourselves and in others of excessive zeal for goals that seem worthy. We know that we are properly judged both by what we intend, what our motives are, and what we do. Second, we're reminded of the need in the exercise of power for the constant and free and unedited flow of advice and information. We all know of the constraints and weaknesses that tend to interfere, interfere with this easy flow of information. Free exchange is time consuming. It confronts us with conflict. We know the unpleasantness and the risk of bearing bad news, and we know how much we dislike to hear it. Yet we see how perilous it is when information and advice and counsel are fed through a screen that's too fine for the complexity of the problem, and how dangerous and, dangerous and orthodoxy is that is too strict for useful heresies to be heard. The basic protection against this malfunction of interfering with the free flow of information, the basic protection as I see it against this malfunction is the firm personal conviction that listening to others in a posture of respect for them and humility for oneself, that listening to others will improve the quality of our decisions. Conversely, probably the major crime of arrogance is its adverse effect on the exchange of information and ideas. Thirdly, I'd like to have you contemplate and reflect on the complicated problem of loyalty. There's a substantial wisdom in our society in requiring loyalty from those who work for us and giving it to those for whom we work. But we are reminded by Watergate that loyalty is an exceedingly complicated matter. One can have too limited a definition of loyalty so that mere disagreement during policy development or the critical examination of policy already established, when that results in either banishment or silence. We also know that loyalty can be too restricted to a person rather than an office of the institution. All of us have responsibility to see that decisions once made are executed fairly and sensitively and loyally, but not at the cost of the stoppage of other ideas, not at the prevention of inadequate review, and most importantly, 
not at the expense of abandoning a principled behavior. Finally, let me contemplate the pervasiveness of leadership. Every bit as important as pronouncements that are made, the orders that are given, or policies stated, Watergate reminds us of the importance of the leader's values, attitudes, and style. No memoranda of any leader necessarily are, ne are necessary. No one, memoranda have to be written in order for decisions to be made or for policies to be executed or for problems to be solved. This fact of life, the pervasiveness of leadership, is a great advantage in human affairs. Often we're proud when those who work for us reflect our values and our attitudes and make decisions in the spirit of those values and attitudes. This kind of a social structure multiplies the leader's effectiveness and reduces the need for consultation. And we're pleased or should be pleased when we ourselves respond in this way to those for whom we work. And there isn't anything that we can or should do to change this. The important matter is to recognize that this pervasiveness exists and that it can malfunction. Above all, this new reminder of the pervasive nature of leadership requires each of us to examine what it is that we communicate to those who assist us, communicate to them about our goals, our attitudes, and our standards of style. What do those who work for us or with us assume that our attitudes are toward people, toward fairness, toward failure, toward disagreement? What do they conclude about the weight we give to our promises? What ways of influencing other people are acceptable to us? Several recent studies have shown a progressive loss of public confidence in the leadership of virtually all institutions, the church, educational institutions, business, law, government. And the Watergate affair has undoubtedly added to that decline. And while the emphasis has been on the loss of confidence in the political process generally, I think all of us make a mistake if we conclude that these are the only areas in which this loss will be felt. From among the many forces that have produced this decline in public confidence, I want to mention one in particular. There has been for some time now in our country, I think, a slow and subtle elevation in our esteem of craftiness, of slickness, of toughness, and pragmatism as desirable leadership characteristics. There has even been a grudging value and increase in the value attributed to dishonesty, to violence, and to hatred, a kind of efficacy attributed to them. I believe, however, that honesty and integrity and compassion and cooperation are the virtues, that they are stronger, and that they will prevail. I think we can be steadfast in that enriching belief without being maudlin or over-romantic about the nature of man. But given the pervasiveness of leadership, it is imperative that all of us in positions of power and responsibility communicate our commitment to these values in everything we do. Only in that way will we play a part in restoring confidence in our institutions only in that way can we strengthen the public belief that those in power will use that power for the welfare of all and not for themselves. And only by manifesting these values in our behavior can we respond to Watergate constructively, not only for the benefit of the institutions we serve, but for the good of all society. Now, one final observation in the hope that what I have said has convinced you that Watergate has lessons for everyone. It turns out, as I see it in the past 10 days or two weeks, that the problem now uppermost on the minds of all of us is not primarily the authorization of the break-in or the role in the cover-up or the obstruction of justice, important as they are, but the important questions are those concerned with the kind of man 
he is. What does he regard as his highest duty? Does he manipulate people or does he respect them? Is his influence around those, on those around him benign or malignant? Does he have a decent respect for the opinions of mankind? In short, is he a good man? Not a perfect man or a flawless man, but is he a good man? Now, whether these are the proper questions on the matter of impeachment, I leave to others to decide. But I, and I urge you to believe that I'm not insisting on any particular answer to them. I'm urging you to transcend the specific case. But I do say that these are the proper questions for any nation that as aspires to being a moral society. These are the proper questions for them to ask, and not for a nation only. They are the important questions for any human life, and they are inescapable. Throughout your life, they will be asked by your friends, by your family, your colleagues, your superiors, your subordinates, they are the ultimate questions, the answers to which determine the value of your life. And the vivid example before us is that unless the answers are positive, that you do respect and honor your colleagues, that you do have integrity and so on, unless the answers are positive, fame and fortune and even the highest responsibility in the nation's gift will be ashes in your mouth. My hope and my prayer is that as a consequence of our collective calamity, you will, as a matter of duty, daily ask these questions of personal morality and integrity of yourself. If you adopt this habit of concern with the morality of what you do, Watergate will, by the grace of God, be turned to good effect for you, for all those whose lives are affected by you, and for the republic we cherish, and for whose future we are all responsible. Thank you and good luck. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. I would I'd like to say that I would be pleased if several years from now these graduates would remember who their commencement speaker was, but I would hope that we will remember these very thought-provoking questions and observations which you have made for us. At this time, Dr. Richard W. Burkhart, Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties, will present the graduating class. Mr. President, the Dean of Undergraduate Programs, Dr. Victor B. Lawhead, will present the candidates for Associate and Baccalaureate degree. Will the candidates for the degree Associate in Arts please rise? Will the candidates for the degree Associate in Science please rise? Mr. President, as Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties, I present to you as candidates for degrees those who on or before this day have completed or have a reasonable expectation of completing all of the stated requirements for their respective associate degrees. I present the candidates in absentia and those who stand before you. Upon the recommendation of the faculty that you have or will have completed all of the requirements for graduation and that you have proved yourselves worthy of that honor, now by the authority vested in the Board of Trustees and delegated to me, I hereby confer upon you the associate degrees which you have earned with all the rights, privileges, and obligations pertaining thereto, and of which the diplomas issued by the university shall forever be the testimony. Will the graduates be seated? Those candidates who have completed the university honors program 
and those who are scheduled for high scholastic honors are wearing red and white honors cords. At this time, I would like to ask those candidates who have completed the honors program to please rise and be recognized. You may be seated. The highest scholastic honors go to those students whose cumulative point ratios place them in the categories of graduating uh, cum laude, magna cum laude, summa cum laude. Graduates who have achieved at least 3.4, but less than 3.6, are graduating cum laude. Will you please rise and be recognized? You may be seated. Graduates who have uh, completed an academic career with at least 3.6 but less than 3.8 are graduating magna cum laude. Will you please rise? You may be seated. Highest university honors goes to those graduates who have graduated with 3.8 or better, they graduate summa cum laude. Will you please rise? You may be seated. Will the candidates for the degree Bachelor of Architecture please rise? Will the candidates for the degree Bachelor of Landscape Architecture please rise? Will the candidates for the degree Bachelor of Arts please rise? Will the candidates for the degree Bachelor of Science please rise? Mr. President, as Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties, I present to you as candidates for degrees those who honor before this day have completed or have a reasonable expectation of completing all of the stated requirements for their respective baccalaureate degrees. I present the candidates in absentia and those who stand before you. In addition, I wish to present posthumously the name of Larry D. Lee Master, who unfortunately died before the term was completed. Upon the recommendation of the faculty that you have or will have completed all of the requirements for graduation and that you have proved yourselves worthy of that honor, now by the authority vested in the Board of Trustees and delegated to me, I confer on you the degrees for which you are competent with all the rights, privileges, and obligations pertaining thereto of which the diplomas issued by the university shall forever be the testimony. Will the graduates be seated? <laughs> the Dean of the Graduate School, Dr. Robert H. Kinker, will present the candidates for graduate degrees. In the interest of expediency, the master's candidates are already hooded. <clears throat> Will the candidates for the degree Master of Science please rise? Will the candidates for the degree Master of Music please rise? Candidates for the degree Master of Business Administration please rise? Will the candidates for the degree Master of Public Administration please rise? Will the candidates for the degree Master of Library Science please rise? Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Education please rise? Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts please rise? 
Mr. President, as Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties, I present to you as candidates for degrees those who honor before this day have completed or have a reasonable expectation of completing all of their stated requirements for their respective degrees. I present the candidates in absentia and those who stand before you. Upon the recommendation of the faculty that you have completed all of the requirements for graduation, that you have proved yourselves worthy of that honor, and that you have accomplished with distinction the first stage of graduate study, now by the authority vested in the Board of Trustees and delegated to me, I confer on you the degrees for which you are competent, with all the rights, honors, privileges, and obligations pertaining thereto, of which the diplomas issued by the university shall forever be the testimony. Will the graduates be seated? <laughs> Will the candidates for the degree specialist in education please rise? Will the candidates for the degree doctor of philosophy please rise? Will the candidates for the degree doctor of education please rise? Mr. President, as Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties, I present to you as candidates for degrees those who on or before this day have completed or have a reasonable expectation of completing all of the stated requirements for their respective advanced degrees. I present the candidates in absentia and those who stand before you. Upon the recommendation of the faculty that you have completed all of the requirements for graduation, that you have proved yourselves worthy of that honor, and that you have reached scholarly attainment with high distinction in your field, now by the authority vested in the Board of Trustees and delegated to me, I confer on you the advanced graduate degrees for which you are competent, with all the rights, honors, privileges, and obligations pertaining thereto, of which the diplomas issued by the university shall forever be the testimony. We have high hopes for your futures as members of the ancient and universal company of scholars. Candidates with advanced degrees will proceed to the platform, cross as their names are called, and be invested with symbols of their degrees. Seven candidates have qualified for the degree specialist in education. Mary Cordelia Rogers, Muncie, Indiana. Terry Lynn Talbot, Marion, Indiana. And in absentia, Michael Evans Drewley, Frankfort, Indiana. Michael Samuel Harrow, Cortland, New York. John Willis Yautze, Clarkston, Georgia. Jean Ann Frewer, Huntington, Indiana. Richard Allen Yarian, Greenwood, Indiana. 27 candidates have qualified themselves for the degree Doctor of Education at Ball State University, and they will now receive the symbols of their degrees. Dr. Ellen Jean Andrews, Assistant Professor of Education, Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dr. Larry Clifford Brown, Muncie, Indiana. And 
Dr. James L. Land, Muncie, Indiana. Dr. James Sylvester Marshall, Assistant Professor of Education, Anderson College, Anderson, Indiana. And Dr. Wayne Douglas Massey, Headmaster, Woodlawn Academy, Chatham, Virginia. Dr. Jack Thurston Mays, Assistant Professor of English, New Mexico Highlands University, Las Vegas, New Mexico. And Dr. Janice N. Nisbet, Instructor of English and Coordinator for the Academic Opportunity Freshman Composition Program, Ball State University, Muncie, Indiana. Dr. Charles David Osborne, State Director of Curriculum, State Department of Public Instruction, Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Jerry Dean Pipes, Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay. Dr. Kenneth Dale Swan, Assistant Professor of English, Taylor University, Upland, Indiana. There are, in addition, some graduates who have been unable to attend this ceremony. I present them in absentia. Delbert Lamar Hatton, Assistant Professor of Educational Administration, Ball State University. Lendl Mock, Jr., Assistant Professor, Northern Wells Community Schools, Ossian, Indiana. James Roland Spivy, Area Chairman for Social Studies, Community High School District 218, Worth, Illinois. Joyce Eleonora Teeters, Assistant Professor of Psychology and Counseling, Ball State University. Toby LaBlanche Burden, Assistant Professor of Elementary Education and Director, Early Childhood Education, National College of Education, Evanston, Illinois. Donald Jean Coleman, Associate Professor of Education, Northeast Missouri State University, Kirksville. Brana Ruth Cooperman, Assistant Professor of Elementary Education, State University of New York, College at Buffalo, Buffalo, New York. David Dean, Assistant Professor of Psychology and Counseling, Ball State University. James A. Duffy, Teacher of English, North Central High School, Metropolitan School District, Washington Township, Indianapolis. Larry Edward Garner, Art Instructor Coordinator, Mankato Public Schools, Mankato, Minnesota. Harold Duane Keown, Principal, Blanding Junior High School, Blanding, Utah. Thomas Emmett Magnum III, Instructor of Biology and Physical Science, Valencia Community College, Orlando, Florida. Joseph Clements Raby, Language Arts Teacher, East Ledoux Junior High School, St. Louis Public Schools, St. Louis, Missouri. Mossy Jesse Richmond, Coordinator of the University College and Assistant Professor of Education, Arkansas State University, Jonesboro, Arkansas. Carl Schwenk, Assistant Professor of Biology, Walsh College, Canton, Ohio. Marjorie P. Shaw, 
psychometrist, Eagle Union Community Schools, Zionsville, Indiana, Thomas Howard Wynn, Director of Safety and Security, Austin P. State University, Clarksville, Tennessee. The following three candidates have qualified for the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Dr. Patricio Royo Mamot, Research Fellow, Emergency Medical Service, Marion County General Hospital, Indianapolis, Indiana. In addition, in absentia, Carolyn Marlon Frank, Associate Professor of History and Urban Studies, Edinburgh State College, Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, and Robert George Webb, Associate Professor of History and Acting Chairman of Social Science Department, Northern State College, Aberdeen, South Dakota. Doctor of Laws degree is now to be awarded to Dr. Roger Hines. Dr. Proust will read the citation. Roger W. Hines, you understand higher education as few educational leaders in the United States can. As a psychology professor, dean of the College of Literature, Science, and Arts, and vice president for academic affairs at the University of Michigan, a consultant for the Carnegie Corporation, general education intern at Harvard University, and chancellor at the University of California, Berkeley during the turbulent 60s, you have witnessed firsthand and participated in all of the triumphs and struggles of colleges and universities since World War II. Now, as president of the prestigious American Council on Education, you offer a very special brand of tempered, reasoned leadership which makes you a most effective spokesman for higher education in the United States. Your voice, wise and influential, speaks for us all on the national scene. You have contributed impressively to the literature of your chosen discipline, psychology, since 1944 on topics ranging from classification tests for candidates in the Army Air Force Officer Candidate School to research on older citizens and their growth development the nature of the academic community, and the ever important subject of understanding students. As an author, your books, The Psychology of Personal Adjustment and An Anatomy for Conformity, and your overview on the outlook for higher education in the 70s are further evidence of the diversity and the magnitude of your interests and scholarly comprehension of the challenges of the day. Both the University of Michigan and the University of California have recognized your qualities as an outstanding teacher and have accorded you honors for service to higher education. The San Francisco Conference on Religion, Race, and Social Concern has cited you for leadership as educator, churchman, and citizen in that community. Higher education in transition requires dedication in immense proportions of its leadership, integrity, courage, and a practical vision. For these qualities, Ball State University is proud to confer upon you the honorary Doctor of Laws degree with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining. We're going to put the whole day to The honorary degree of Doctor of Laws is now to be awarded to Dr. Law G. Montgomery. President Proust will read the citation. Lal G. Montgomery, medical educator, pathologist, humanitarian, scholar, wise friend, and counselor. This community, Ball State University, and the medical profession owe you, Lal G. Montgomery, a deep debt of gratitude for your inspiring leadership, loyalty, enthusiasm, 
and warm personal interest in whatever program you have undertaken in its behalf. Your influence has been felt at all levels in medical education, including your own specialization, pathology. Our students and medical technologists around the world are the benefactors of your dedication to the concept that medicine must maintain high standards. You have insisted, and wisely so, that laboratory technicians must be competently prepared with both collegiate education and experience in an approved clinical laboratory. You led efforts to ensure quality control procedures in the laboratory designed to assure the patient, patient and physician valid test results. For 24 years, you served as chairman of the Board of Registry of Medical Technologists, which between 1940 and 1964 certified more than 43,000 applicants and through its world headquarters, located for many years in Muncie, helped medical technologists find employment. Appropriately, the medical profession has acknowledged your contributions by electing you president of the American Society of Clinical Pathologists, a founding fellow of the College of American Pathologists, a fellow of the American Medical Association, and on an international scale to life membership in the Pan American Medical Association. We at Ball State appreciate your interest in this university through the past 40 years. Your support and endorsement of its programs, be they in the arts or sciences, your commitment to medical education on this campus, and your readiness to teach our medical technology students at the fourth year clinical level, as well as your service to the Department of Physiology and Health Science as adjunct professor, to the Muncie Center for Medical Education at Ball State, and to the Family Practice Residency Program. It was a fortunate day for Ball Memorial Hospital, for Ball State University, and for this community when you joined us on July 1, 1934. In recognition of your service to the university, the community, and your profession, Ball State University is proud to grant you, Lal G. Montgomery, the honorary degree Doctor of Laws with all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining. I'm going to hold Dr. Montgomery here for just a moment while I ask Mrs. Montgomery, who is seated to my left, your right, to stand and be recognized with Dr. Montgomery. Mrs. Montgomery, thanks for being To you, the May 1974 graduates of Ball State University, I would add only a few words. Today you join the well over 40,000 men and women who have graduated from Ball State University. And this ceremony celebrates very properly your accomplishments as students. All of us here commend you for this significant accomplishment. But we also quickly add that our expectations of each of you are now the greater. You came to Ball State University to be students. We hope that you leave to become productive and responsible members of society. The outside world will not honor you for the degree or the degrees you hold. It will honor only your contributions to our society. It expects you to do more than earn a living. It expects you to put your new knowledge and experience to work for the betterment of mankind. And it sorely needs you for that purpose. If the university has fulfilled its primary purpose, you will use your education in identifying and seeking to solve a wide variety of problems. And this will come about only as you become personally dedicated to and involved in serving your society and your fellow man. Now, while there are many of you here today who have earned your degrees by dint of your own efforts alone, and we commend you for that, I know that there are many in the audience who have sacrificed some of their own time and resources so that many of you graduates might be in cap and gown on this occasion. Some of them are your parents, some are husbands, some are wives, several are children, others are relatives, still others are mighty good friends. And I would ask them now, 
all of them to stand so that you graduates might thank them for their efforts on your behalf with your applause. Won't the parents and all of the rest of you stand up? Thank you so much. The warmth and enthusiasm and ready response of my request to the graduates for the applause should speak to all of you very, very well. Then, too, graduates, may I, on your behalf, thank the faculty and the staff of this university, most of whom were simply walked through because the overflow crowd did not permit them to retain their seats, I'm sorry. But may I thank them for their significant role in guiding you through the many experiences which have brought you to this place today. You know, the strength and the reputation of any university reside in large measure, very large measure, in the loyalty and the performance of her alumni. We trust that all of you will be willing to serve Ball State through your continued interest and support. Perhaps our major vehicle of communication with you will be through the Alumni Association, and we urge you to be an active member of that nationally recognized organization. We invite you to visit us whenever you can, we solicit your comments about our programs and our policies, but this is one of the best ways we have of evaluating what we are doing. We congratulate you for your past achievements and wish you very well in your future endeavors. God bless you. We ask the audience to remain seated until the graduates have cleared the gymnasium. We ask all of you to join in the Ball State alma mater. Oh. 